Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Smaha, and I am Manomet's Director of Marketing and Communications. I'm pleased to welcome you into Manomet's Banding Lab, where our staff has been collecting data on migrating birds for more than 50 years. Over those 50 years, we have hosted thousands of people from school groups to researchers to families and other visitors at our Banding Lab. Unfortunately, this fall, due to COVID-19, we have enacted strict procedures limiting visitors to keep our banders and staff safe and have not been able to welcome people in. Needless to say, we are missing seeing everyone and are really excited to have you here with us today. I hope you enjoy this opportunity to meet our banders and staff, learn about the research we conduct, and even see a few birds close up. If you're new to Manomet, we are a science-driven sustainability nonprofit. Since Manomet's beginnings in 1969, our programs have branched out far beyond our Plymouth, Massachusetts-based bird banding operation. With shorebird recovery and habitat management, forestry and climate science, fisheries, and more, Manomet has its foundation in science and works with many global partners to create a thriving future. Just a couple of quick things before we begin. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, use your mouse pointer to hover over the bottom and it should appear. If at any point during the presentation you have a question, feel free to click on that Q&A box to enter it. We are monitoring the Q&A and will answer as many questions as possible. If you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, it is being recorded. We will send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording in the next day or so. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to turn it over now to Evan and our banding, and our land, and our banding team um, with a quick introduction of our banders. Uh, so Emily, I don't know if you mind showing uh, the banding team. We have Sarah Duff, who has been banding now with Manomet for several seasons. And most recently, uh, her, she was working on the island of Rota in the South Pacific, monitoring the endangered Mariana Crow. Megan Gray, who is returning to M Manomet for her fifth season at the Banding Lab. She's an experienced bander and overall naturalist, and she's logged over 400 speci species at headquarters on iNaturalist since 2018. Cynthia, Cynthia Ramirez, who is a graduate of Virginia Ma Virginia's George Mason University, and she's worked on ecological projects in Guyana and Peru. And finally, Jeremiah Sullivan, who is a native of Massachusetts and uh, recently completed his undergraduate degree at Boise State University and is an avid birder and has led, also led bird tours for Mass Audubon around Plum Island. And last, not, last but not least, we have Evan Dalton, our lead instructor, instructor for land bird conservation. So Evan. Awesome, thank you, Danielle, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, you, as Danielle said, uh, this season is certainly one of our stranger seasons of the last uh, 54 or so years, uh, in that we're really limiting uh, people visiting the lab, but we're super happy that you guys can get here and that you're able to see at least a little bit of what we do, even if it is under strange circumstances. Um, so you can see, we're on the property here and we've got our uh, banding table outside today. So you can see uh, banding taking place in real time uh, in the open air, which is for safety reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, starting at dawn this morning, uh, birds were coming down, they migrate at night. So they're coming down here, uh, spending their time in the forest around here, uh, stocking up on food and everything. Uh, and as they're doing that, hopefully they're flying into our mist nets, which is how we capture the birds. We'll talk about those in a little bit. But right now we actually have some birds that the banders have brought back. And you'll see that the birds are brought back in, in these cloth bags that are basically made out of pillowcases. Um, and those are they make it a lot easier for us to hold the birds um, and to carry a lot of birds at one time, um, but they also keep the birds safe and secure um, while they're waiting to be banded. So we've got two lovely examples of the same species. Does anyone recognize these birds? Feel free to type it into the chat. Perhaps one of the more recognizable birds here in the Northeast. Okay, um, so Blue Jay, 
it's pretty obvious. We don't have to look him up and decide what species he is. Um, we have all these different size bands for different species of birds. And so we know that we did take size two. So, can I give you any size two, Jeremiah? Six. One, two, six. What was that? One, two, six. Yeah, right. So each band has a unique nine digit code. And so I just read him the last three to make sure it was the correct band put on. And it is. If people cannot hear what's going on, just type it into the chat and we'll try to speak louder if, if that's the case. Uh -oh. Can I give you another new two or are you giving a repeat? No, no finish up. That's okay. Yeah, I'm gonna put these are special banding pliers that fit the exact band size that we need. So it'll fit around his leg perfectly. Just give it an extra squeeze to make sure it's all the way closed. So we should say that um, the way that we're holding these birds right here two, one, two, seven. is maximizing the safety for the birds and the handlers themselves. Although really you're not at any risk of really being harmed by most of the birds we catch. Um, and fortunately, they're not really at risk of any harm from us either. Um, so certain birds tend to be a bit more calm than others. And we'll notice even within certain species, individuals can be more calm than others. Um, but uh, most blue jays tend to be pretty, uh, pretty calm in the hand. But uh, this is a common grip used in the, in the field called the Banders grip. Um, and just keeps the wings pinned to the side. You can see that uh, both Megan and Sarah just took wing measurements on these birds uh, using a wing ruler. Okay. Evan, we have a question. Uh, I know that Northern Cardinal are notorious for biting and thrushes tend to poop on banders. What are blue jays notorious for when banding? Uh, well, a few things. Sometimes when blue jays actually, so you see Megan's bird, they'll, they'll actually grab their own feet. Uh, and when they do that, sometimes they'll kind of go into a bit of a meditative trance. <laughs> um, that's probably what they're best known for in the hand, uh, besides being really beautiful. So right now, Megan is attempting to look through the skin on the back of this bird's skull. Now we have multiple ways of figuring out how old birds are. Um, and one of the most reliable methods is actually by this technique called sculling. Um, so young birds, when they first hatch out, only have one layer of bone in their skull. Um, and over the first several months of life, a second layer actually grows in in a specific pattern. Um, and if you can actually peer through the skin, you can actually see the second layer growing in underneath the first layer. Um, on these guys, it can be kind of hard because uh, blue jays and a lot of other corvids have um, more pigment in their skin. So it's sort of tough to see through there. Um, but fortunately for us, we have other methods for aging too, which we'll talk about in a second. <laughs> On your bird. I think mine's a pretty obvious hack here. Um, he doesn't have any barring on the primary coverts uh -huh. here, which adults will have like nice blue and black barring. And he also has a lot of stripes on his tail, where after hack years will have fewer but thicker black stripes. Yeah. This is a great example, actually. This bird has replaced a few of its feathers, mm -hmm. even, whereas this one has not. So you can see some of the barring on these feathers that maybe came out a while back. Um, and this one doesn't have that barring on it. So when this bird uh, molts uh, next year, it's going to replace all these feathers here with barred ones. Uh, but right now, both of these birds <laughs> hatched out this year. And it's a, a banner year for blue jays. Yeah. I guess they both have pink mouths too. Yeah. Yeah, pretty pink. 
Another way to age blue jays is to look at the color of the inside of their mouth. Um, Sarah's bird in particular <laughs> is giving us a great look inside the mouth. And you can see that it's quite pink in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect. You might be able to see in there a little bit. Anywho, it's nice uh, sort of coral pink color in there. Um, and as that bird ages, that pink coloration will go away. It'll be more dark. So now we know that these blue jays are hatchier birds, or they hatched out this year. Um, we know how big they are from their wing, and you'll see that we just put that one in a cone on top of a scale, <laughs> which looks super ridiculous. Uh, here goes Sarah with hers. Um, but that actually keeps the birds uh, still long enough for us to actually get a um, weight on the bird. Seventy-six point nine grams. Excellent. Okay, so now that we have all the information on these birds, these guys are then going to read them off to our computer program inside. Now, normally, all of this would take place inside the lab, but we're doing this outside just for safety and to show you guys what's happening. But uh, our computer program will actually look at a lot of the measurements and it will actually have a filter on it. So if some of the measurements are too large uh, or too small uh, on average, uh, the computer will actually let us know. So it's sort of a good error checking uh, system. Okay, so you guys can see that took place very quickly and we're even showing you guys things. Um, so this bird is totally ready to go. Uh, and we'll get a quick look at it right before it goes. Awesome, thank you. Do you have anything else? Awesome. Evan, is there a goal for how fast you process each bird? Um, no, not, not specifically. Uh, some birds take longer than others depending on measurements. Um, but we're very uh, aware of um, how long we're taking to process birds. Um, typically, it only takes about a minute or so. Um, but if a bird is, um, if, if, we, if we have a sense that the bird is being stressed out or anything, um, which is not super common but does happen, um, we'll let that bird go uh, as soon as we notice that and um, let it get on with its, with its daily tasks. Um, but yeah, it typically only takes about a minute or so to process a bird. So this is one that's particularly noisy. This, this bird is very much sort of the um, the mascot of our <laughs> banding operation. Uh, we've caught more of this species than any other species. New 1A. Should be 717. It's a great capper. And there you heard it. That's exactly what our species <laughs> is. The gray catbird being banded by Megan Gray. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so catbirds make a lot of noise. They're related to mockingbirds. Um, and uh, if you have a brushy area or a forsythia or a rose bush in your backyard, uh, there's, and you live in the Eastern United States or North America, uh, there's a good chance that you're quite familiar with gray catbirds. See, Megan just put a size 1A band on that, which is a little bit smaller than what we put on a blue jay. She measured the wing of the catbird. She's now feeling around for uh, subcutaneous fat. 
which is one way of us telling whether or not uh, this bird is putting on weight before it migrates. Uh, great catbirds migrate all the way down to Central America. So uh, this bird's got a long way to go. Now checking the bird over to see if it's molting, which is just the uh, replacement of feathers. And like I said, some birds are uh, very quiet in the hand. Other ones make a lot of noise. Uh, cat birds tend to make a lot of noise, but uh, that's totally okay. <laughs> So now Megan is sculling this catbird. She's looking for uh, maybe differences in whether there's one or two layers of bone in the skull there. And once again, just like the uh, blue jay, there are multiple ways of aging a bird too. So sometimes if you can't get a look at the skull, no biggie. Um, we can look at some other characteristics of each bird. Um, cat birds in particular, uh, they have uh, grayer eyes when they're younger. Uh, just, like the, uh, just like the blue jay, their mouths are pale on the inside when uh, for the first few months of their lives. Um, and you can also see some contrast in the wing as well. Megan, how did you, how did you age this bird? So he's got uh, a not fully ossified skull. So he's got a two skull. This is a nicer looking hatchier bird. So a bird that hatched out this season. Um, so his eye is pretty dark right now, but the younger birds will have sort of a, a grayish tinge to their eye. It's sort of brownish. And then as they get older, it'll turn into a nice, dark pool. <laughs> it's just very dark. It's like a blackberry yeah. color. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the inside of his mouth has a little bit of, it might be hard to see, a little bit of a gape left, but mostly the skull and uh, he's got a nice little molt limit in his greater coverts and I'm not sure we'll translate. Oh, but yeah. Right here. Yeah, right so these are his nice replaced feathers. These are his older feathers that he's retained. So this molt limit the eye color, the unossified skull, and the mouth are all pointing towards a hatchier bird. So just needs his weight. Now we say he here because we, although we don't actually know <laughs> if it's don't. a male or a female, um, but at Manomet there's uh, a tradition of calling every unknown bird George. <laughs> don't know where it came from. So we got a weight on this cat bird. This catbird is a hatchier bird, which means that it hatched out in a bush somewhere probably within a few hundred miles of here. Um, and uh, this bird is about to embark on his maiden journey down south. It has never migrated south before, yet somehow it's going to migrate some thousand, fifteen hundred miles or something, uh, all the way down to Central America. And uh, if things go well, it'll come back next year. Um, but here along the coast, we tend to get a lot of hatching year birds because they're using the coast to navigate. The coast is the most obvious north-south uh, indicator out there. Um, and if they follow the coast down, uh, they'll get them there eventually. Um, but next year, in the fall, if this bird uh, makes it through overwintering and everything, it will probably be taking a different route um, to head south. A little bit more inland. All right, okay. cat bird ready to go? Yep. Guess not. <laughs> Excellent. So in a few minutes, our banders are gonna go on a net run which is basically when they go out and check the nets that we have here to see if any birds have flown into them. Um, we have 50 mist nets up around the property and the mist nets imagine a 20 foot long, seven foot tall hair net. 
and that's basically what a mist net is. Um, they're strung up all throughout our 20 or so acres of uh, trails here at Manomet. Um, it's a big reason why uh, we don't necessarily encourage people to walk around the trails here because uh, they can be hard to see and they're very easy to, um, they're very delicate as well. Um, but since they're hard to see, birds will fly into them and the birds will then fall into a pocket in the net and then our banders can go around and extract the birds out very quickly. Um, and once they do that, they go into that bag that you guys saw, come back here and they get banded. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, one of the aspects of banding is attempting to predict when you're going to see the most birds. Um, usually predictions are wrong because it's really hard to predict. Um, but factors that influence uh, how many birds are around are typically related to weather, weather patterns. And in the fall, if you're a bird migrating south, you want some good tailwinds. Um, so if there are nice northerly winds at night, um, that can help push birds south and more birds will be taking off. Uh, like I said, the majority of the birds that we catch here and band here are migrating at night, which they do for several reasons. One is it's cooler at night. Two, there are fewer predators at night. And three, they can use uh, certain aspects of their environment to navigate. So at night they can see the stars and we've actually proven that uh, birds can migrate and recognize star patterns to help them migrate. So it's uh, pretty, pretty amazing what they do. Um, but uh, yeah, last night there was, uh, it was quite warm yesterday. It's about 20 degrees cooler this morning than it was yesterday. So a nice cool front came through last night uh, northerly winds pushed a ton of birds. Uh, we know this because we can actually monitor migration in real time uh, using weather radar, which is super cool. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately the winds were from the northwest, so they're pushing birds towards the coast slightly, but then they kind of shifted uh, to be from the northeast right before dawn. So that pushed birds back inland. Um, and my guess is that uh, right now, if you're birding in, say, the Pioneer Valley of Massachusetts, um, or even further inland, say, uh, Pennsylvania, my guess is that um, there are quite a few more birds there than there are here today. Evan, we have a couple of questions that have come in while we've been talking. Sure. Yeah. Um, can you... Uh, talk about the bands that you use and how heavy they are and how do you ensure that the band is not too tight on the bird's feet? Yeah, those are excellent questions. So we've got this antiquated uh, visual aid here. Um, as Sarah was saying, each of these bands has its own specific number uh, that is, that is uh, only found on that one band. Um, and the bands come in a multitude of sizes. All of the bands that we put on birds here are in aluminum alloy. Aluminum is super lightweight, um, so it makes up a very tiny, tiny portion of the bird's overall weight. Um, super important for it to be lightweight because we don't want it to be affecting the bird's ability to fly or do anything else. Um, and uh, many, many years and many, many studies later, uh, we're quite certain that putting bands on birds is not detrimental to their health. Um, these bands all come to us from the, uh, the centralized government banding office. They're actually the ones who keep track of all the band numbers that go on every bird in North America um, and anyone who's using a North American permit in Central and South America too. Um, like I said, since the bands come so many different sizes, that allows us to uh, make sure that we're putting the right size band on uh, the bird's leg. Um, it's important for the band to move freely on the leg but not slip down too far that it can um, cover up the foot. Um, does that answer those questions? Excellent, does. I get to talking and then, you know. <laughs> um, and then earlier when we were talking about the gray catbird, you mentioned that you couldn't 
uh, sex that particular bird. Can you talk a little bit about how you do determine sex with the birds? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so there are a bunch of uh, different ways of doing that, uh, depending on the time of year and depending on the species. Um, so for great cat birds, uh, they are not what we would call a dimorphic species. Di meaning two, morph meaning forms. So uh, males and females look the same. Uh, the easiest way to tell uh, the sex of a gray cat bird is uh, whether or not it has developed a brood patch in the summer. Um, so during the breeding season, female uh, songbirds, many female songbirds will actually uh, lose the feathers um, right around their belly area and the skin underneath there will kind of get kind of really poofy uh, and that actually allows them to uh, better transfer their heat to the eggs and the young that they have in the nest. Um, that's what we call a brood patch um, and we often see that late in our spring banding season around June we'll see that on birds around here and sometimes we can even see it early 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 on like in August uh, when we band in the fall. Um, as far as other species, um, things like northern cardinals are a classic example of a, a sexually dimorphic species. So the males look very different from the females. Um, those differences can be a bit more subtle in some of the other species like a uh, black and white warbler. Um, but there are certain plumage characteristics we can look at on, on, um, on certain species that allow us to determine whether it's a male or a female. And then lastly, in some species, uh, the males might be a different size than the females. So we can look at wing length uh, or tail length uh, to determine whether, uh, to help us better determine whether a spe an individual is a male or a female. Tons of information there, way too much. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, we have a couple of questions about the um, California wildfires and um, there being a strange late this morning, um, potentially from those fires. And do you think this is gonna have any effect on migration? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I would guess that the answer would be yes. But the real answer is going to be determined uh, through long-term monitoring like we do here. Fortunately, there are several banding stations along the West Coast um, and hawk watches along the west coast as well. Um, hawk watches are where people uh, monitor migrating hawks as they fly past in late morning. Um, hawks do not migrate at night uh, because they rely on columns of warm air to move. Um, so uh, my guess is that uh, not only will the smoke um, influence the, the bird's ability to navigate, um, but it might even change uh, the routes that they take. Um, and I'm particularly curious if, say, more easterly or uh, western birds will start showing up uh, taking more easterly routes this year. We'll see. Um, and uh, it's an excellent question and certainly something that we're keeping an eye on. Um, and it's really something that uh, illustrates the benefit of long-term research where we can actually see uh, whether things have changed. Excellent. Um, another question. Uh, we have a couple of questions about recapture birds. And yep. do we see a lot of them and are there any patterns to that recapture? Yeah, great question. Um, so none of the birds that we just caught were recaptured birds. Um, so a recaptured bird is one with a band already on it. Um, the overwhelming majority of birds that we catch with a band already on them, uh, that band was put there by us. Um, and a large portion of those uh, are actually from either the spring season or from earlier on this season. So we band in the spring from mid-April to mid-June every year and in the fall from mid-August to mid-November every year. Um, a handful of birds will actually live here on the property um, and we'll catch those birds year after year. Um, and those are recaptures that are season to season and year to year, which is pretty cool. Um, and then a very small portion, maybe one or two a year, are what we call foreign recaptures, where they're bands that we see on birds um, 
that are from a different banding station altogether, um, which is pretty cool. So I can show you guys a little bit about where our birds go and where our birds come from. Um, if one of our birds leaves here with a band on it and it's found somewhere else, and then somebody reports that band, that's a lot of steps that have to happen. So it doesn't happen super often. But say we banded a cat's bird and it left here and it flew all the way down to New Jersey and someone down at uh, the Cape May Bird Observatory captured our banded bird and reported it, we would then be able to put a little red dot where that bird was captured. And we can see on this map, this is uh, a map of all of our band recoveries from land birds that were banded here and were found in the red dot place. And then all of the green dots are where our foreign recovered birds came from. So we can see some interesting foreign recaptures like this green one down here was actually an American goldfinch that was banded a couple falls prior to them being banded all the way up here in Massachusetts. Um, some people who are very curious may ask about some of these dots down here in northeastern uh, South America and then some of these dots along um, the, uh, southern, the eastern coast of the uh, southern cone of South America. Uh, if you're familiar with Manomet's work on shorebirds, you'll know that we actually did some banding um, uh, a couple decades ago on Plymouth Beach. And we captured uh, semi-palmated sandpipers and we also uh, captured and banded uh, red knots as well. Both of these are very long distance shorebirds and that's what these clusters of birds are. So these are primarily semi-palmated sandpipers and along the Brazilian coast um, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, those are actually red knots, um, which are another long distance shorebird migrant. One of the overall patterns you'll notice of our recoveries is that they're almost purely restricted to the eastern seaboard. Um, and that sort of uh, illustrates one of the key concepts of a North American bird migration, really bird migration in general, is this migratory pathway or what we call a flyway, um, which is basically just a general pattern that uh, large groups of birds take as they migrate. Um, so there are a few flyways that go through North America, but uh, the majority of our birds stick to the Atlantic flyway. And Evan, can you clarify, if somebody does uh, happen to see the numbers on a band, where do they report that to? Yeah, so it, it used to be uh, quite rare for people to not only find a band, but to report it because it was a bit more difficult. Uh, even these tiny, tiny bands have a tiny bit of contact information on them. Uh, they used to have an address, which you can imagine now if you just mailed it to Washington, D.C., the chances of a band getting to the right place are pretty low. Um, but now they have a phone number on them, which I think is 1-800-BANDS. Um, but also, if you just Google search, I found a banded bird, it will take you right to the USGS webpage to report a banded bird. Um, most of the people who report banded birds have either found a dead or injured uh, bird. Um, but nowadays, people are so good with cameras and the technology is so good um, that for some of these larger bands, if people get a series of photos, they can even uh, determine the nine, eight or nine digit number on the band, which is pretty cool. That is very cool. Um, and this question is for you or any of the banders who might still be there. I don't know if they went back to the, the nets they're, or not, but... They're out putting in the work trying to the, get some birds. Excellent, good. Um, so what are the most rare or unusual birds that you might have seen come through the banding lab? Uh, yeah, throughout the years we've uh, had quite a few interesting creatures show up in the lab. Um, most recently, uh, we, uh, we'll sometimes get exotic species that people either keep as pets. Um, most recently, we got a Eurasian goldfinch, um, which was pretty weird. Um, that's a species that's very common in the pet trade, but um, not super common outside. Uh, and this bird was actually migrating with a group of American goldfinches up and down the coast. And it had fat buildup underneath its skin. So it was like it was planning on migrating, pretty wild. Um, 
We also will catch uh, rare species from other places uh, in North America. Uh, the first state record of Bell's Vireo, which is a central breeding species of bird, a uh, central U.S. breeding species of bird, um, was caught here. Uh, subsequently, we've caught uh, several others of that species here, um, and people have started noticing them too. Um, and then sometimes uh, we'll catch really large things like ruffed grouse, which have no business getting caught in our nets here, um, but banders were in the right place at the right time, and encountered one right before it bounced out of the net. Um, so there are a few different categories of rare or interesting birds here, um, but uh, that's the real fun of, of bird banding is you put those nets up and you know you check them every once in a while, every half hour to an hour, and you know you never know what the heck is gonna be in there when, you, when you're around the corner. Excellent, and that's a important uh, point to make. So we did have some questions about the nets and and if they are taken down when we're not banding so that the bird doesn't stay caught in the net for very many hours and um, so that's that's a great point. Yeah so every uh, banding operation uh, has very strict protocols uh, and our protocols are reviewed uh, fairly frequently uh, for, for any ways that we can improve them. Uh, since we've been going for so long um, uh, with, with little to no incident, um, we're doing all right. But, uh, but yeah, our protocols are, are, our main priority is the safety of the birds, first and foremost. And the second is the integrity of our data collection. Um, so first and foremost is the net itself. And this is an example of what our nets look like. Um, they're made out of nylon, um, and like I said, these are about 20 feet long and 7 feet tall. We have 50 of them up around the property, and we check them about every 40 minutes or so. Um, that allows the birds time to fly into the nets, but um, also means that they're not sitting around there for a long period of time um, to potentially get tangled up. Um, if birds sit in a net for a very long time, um, some of them will tend to get a bit more tangled up, um, so it takes a little bit, little bit longer to extract them. But uh, typically, we come up to a bird in the net and we can get it out in, you know, anywhere from, from 10 to 30 seconds. Um, and uh, yeah, we close our nets at night. We only operate dawn to dusk here. Um, if we had the nets open at night, we'd probably catch things like bats, um, which are not very fun to get out of the nets and not what we're studying. Um, also, we need to sleep sometime, and like I said, the majority of the birds that we're banding here are not migrating at night, or they're, sorry, they're migrating at night, so they're not going to be in the woods at night. Um, they'll be high overhead flying by. Um, Evan, we also have a couple of questions about uh, transmitters and geolocators, and um, Maybe you could talk a little bit about the importance of using those technologies as well as um, what we're doing here in the banding lab with the sightings and the recaptures and the banding track technology. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. It's certainly uh, an exciting time to be a bird biologist. Um, there are many, many new technologies that are allowing us to get a lot more fine scale information on bird migration than just our map. Um, yeah, one of the things I neglected to mention was uh, I was saying how uncommon it is for someone to uh, find a band and correctly report it and all of that. Um, and I would say about one or probably about two in every thousand birds that we band here are going to be recovered somewhere else. Um, so the return on investment is quite low if we're just looking at where the birds go. But since we've been banding here the same way, uh, for such a long period of time, and we take all those other measurements that you guys saw us collect, um, we're actually able to learn a lot more about birds than just where they go. Um, so we can talk about some of the things we've learned in a second, but the point uh, that I want to make now is, is that there are methods that allow us to get a bit more information on some of the routes that birds take. Um, so right now we've got a biologist out on the Cape who are uh, trying to uh, catch and tag a couple uh, wimbrel, which is a large species of shorebird. Uh, it's about the size of a crow and has a bill that's 
super long and curved down. Uh, Wimbrels are long distance shorebird migrants uh, that spend their winters. Uh, we actually know where they spend their winters now uh, because we've placed a few satellite tags on them. They'll actually come and stage on the outer cape and scarf down fiddler crabs. Um, and then once they take off, uh, they go nonstop all the way out over the ocean and land somewhere down here. Um, they'll spend their winter along the northeastern coast of South America and they'll come right back up. Some of them come all the way up the Gulf Coast before reaching their breeding grounds off this map. So uh, pretty, pretty remarkable flights. Um, and the flights that we're able to track, we're able to track them because of these satellite tags that basically give real time information on the movements of these birds um, that we can track. It's an important distinction to make is that when we put a satellite tag on, on a bird and we get the satellite uh, data from that bird, it's only coming from one bird. So we might have dozens of recoveries of uh, catbirds, but if we just put one satellite tag on one catbird, we'd only have the information for that. Um, so I think these technologies are very complementary. Um, they can give us a better fine grain detail image of, of one bird story, um, which not only is compelling to people, but also gives us real time information on all the sites that, that bird is using. Um, but I think as far as bird conservation goes, it's all about using as many technologies as possible. So bird banding is um, uh, certainly not irrelevant. Um, not that any of you were saying that. Um, and it, it still uh, serves a purpose within the uh, general uh, bird migration studying scheme. Excellent. Um, we have another really interesting question here. Have you ever gotten a bird where the banding team could not just settle on a species ID? Um, thinking about some of the confusing fall warblers or some flycatchers perhaps. For sure, for sure. Um, I'll get to that in one second. I want to show you guys uh, one of the birds that Megan is banding. They came back and they got a bird. This one is, okay, they got a couple birds. So I recognize this species. Keeping in mind that we're in Massachusetts. This is our state bird, I believe shared with Michigan. Anywho, this is a black capped chickadee. Um, a feisty little guy or gal, we're not sure. Once again, this is not a dimorphic species, so we can't tell the difference between males and females um, unless it's got a brood patch. So we catch quite a few chickadees here. Um, they even though they don't migrate like the catbird, um, they do have seasonal movements, particularly where young birds will move in large numbers up and down the coast. Um, in the early days of banding here at Manomet, uh, we had a few seasons where we caught thousands of catbirds, or sorry, thousands of chickadees, um, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, nowadays, we don't catch nearly as many we're not exactly sure what caused those huge booms of chickadees. They were pretty unprecedented. Um, so what do we know about this chickadee before we weigh it, Megan? Uh, he's really chewing on my finger there. Um, but he's a hatchier, so he also has uh, an on-on slide skull. Um, and then another characteristic you can look at is the tail shape. So this guy has a super, super pointed tail, not very nicely shaped. Um, an adult would have a much more truncate shape to the tail. Each tail feather would look a lot nicer. Um, and the white border right here would start to get around to this other side of the feather. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see, getting the weight of this chickadee. So this bird weighs less than 10 grams. Which is pretty ridiculous. Less than two nickels. Um, do you want to show the camera the band on the bird okay. real quickly? Uh, some people were asking about um, sort of the size of the band. This is one of the smaller bands we put on them. 
So you can see that it moves freely on the leg, but doesn't slip down over the, uh, over the foot. Mm -hmm. um, so that band is going to stay on that chickadee and uh, hopefully last as long as the bird. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to put this day on the computer and he's good to go. Awesome. So yeah, people asked about some confusing birds. Uh, fall warblers can be confusing, um, but I think they get a bad rap uh, because of things like this, where the term confusing is included in a field guide, gives them a bad rap. Uh, pretty much every warbler that we catch here, we can identify. Um, there are certain plumage characteristics that are unique to that species, um, and uh, hybrids are, are very rare within the spe within uh, within the species of warblers here. Um, but uh, but yeah, so confusing fall warblers, no problem. One of the things that actually hangs us up actually is um, a newer identification challenge, which are some of the Empidonax flycatchers. Um, this is a genus of flycatchers that are found throughout the states. Um, throughout, throughout North America, and they overwinter as far south as South America. Um, but you can see these guys, um, there's a lot of overlap between them. Um, they all typically have some form of eye ring, uh, wing bars, uh, and uh, grayish or greenish back. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some of these species uh, are really difficult to tell apart. Um, particularly the difference between the willow and the alder flycatcher, uh, which until, you know, a few decades ago were actually considered one species, the trail flycatcher. Um, and really what we use to determine the difference between these two species are these very uh, specific measurements of wing feathers. Uh, willow and alder flycatchers actually overwinter in different areas, so they migrate different distances. And typically, if you're a longer distance migrant, you've got longer, uh, longer uh, primary or outer wing feathers so that your wing is pointier. Um, so we can actually measure some of, the, some of the feathers on the wing to help us determine the difference between the two. But there's quite a bit of overlap and all those species that are all those individuals that fall in that overlap, we just call them trail flycatchers. So those are basically, uh, we have it down to two species, but we don't know the difference. Oh, this is a Peterson guide, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, this is a Peterson field guide. Um, I like this one because it's the only one that's come out that is a, a large format edition. So it's really helpful for, um, for showing uh, groups of birds. Um, unfortunately, since this is, uh, I think this was published in 1999. Um, so some of the names of the birds have changed. Um, but anyways, it's really helpful for uh, leading bird walks. Excellent. Um, so Evan, while you're talking about uh, confusing birds, can you talk about the dark-eyed junco uh, white-throated sparrow hybrid that was found? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have, I don't have pictures of it right, uh, right now, but, um, but yeah, uh, that was one of the more interesting birds that we've caught here that uh, uh, in, in recent memory. Um, so this was a hybrid of two different sparrow species. Um, the dark-eyed junco, you guys can probably hear the crows are in the background. I think there's a red-shouldered hawk that they're uh, harassing, so they might interrupt us at some point. But uh, yeah, the dark-eyed junco is a, um, a very familiar backyard bird here in uh, the Northeast in the winter. Um, all throughout the states, there are different forms of the dark-eyed junco. Um, this one is called the Oregon junco. It's got sort of pink sides to it. Um, but there are several different forms of it throughout the states. But here in the Northeast, we typically get um, the dark-eyed junco here. Um, and uh, yeah, we actually captured a bird. Uh, we capture a lot of dark-eyed juncos in the late fall. Um, but we actually captured a hybrid which is an instance of interbreeding. Let's see if I can, chipmunks are going nuts around here. Um, find it eventually. If I look at every page, I'll still miss it. Here we go. 
So another common winter visitor is the white-throated sparrow, um, which has several different characteristics about it, like these white head stripes, but it also has a bright white throat. Um, White-throated sparrows and dark-eyed juncos actually will breed in the same area. So I guess what happened was uh, a dark-eyed junco and a white-throated sparrow uh, got confused and actually had a brood together. And those young actually survived, which is really crazy. Um, so we ended up catching it, which I think is even crazier. And uh, yeah, it had a lot of characteristics of both species. Um, so it had white in its tail. It had the white throat and some of the uh, back and wing markings, um, but overall it looked kind of shaped like a dark eyed junco. Um, so super, super confusing, um, but definitely an interesting bird to be captured here. We've got a really long distance migrant over here. Um, this is a species that just started to come through here. Um, it's a boreal breeding bird, so it breeds way up in Canada. And this bird is one of our longest distance migrants. They'll go all the way to South America um, in some really amazing flights. Takes a size 1B band. Does anyone know what this is? Got a little bit of berry on his face here. Nice. Berry on the face is uh, good evidence that this bird's getting a lot to eat. Uh, berries are the primary food source here uh, along the coast in the fall for these migrating birds. It's got buffy spectacles or glasses. It's got some spots down the breast. Uh, this is a bird that's related to a robin, so it's a type of thrush. It's related to bluebirds and robins, um, but it's actually a Swainson's thrush. Um, Swainson's thrushes are incredible migrants. Um, they've got super long wings, um, and uh, they're just, uh, just spectacular birds. How long is that thing's wing? 99. Woo, baby. It's 99 millimeters. <laughs> um, so yeah, these birds are coming up and down the coast, and they're really focusing on berries. Um, we're interested to see how birds are responding this year to the lack of berry crops. We've had quite a bit of drought here in the northeast. Um, it means that a lot of the berries haven't formed. Um, the plants are too stressed out to create a lot of berries. So we're, we're curious about how that's actually going to be affecting the, the weights of birds and maybe the, the length of time they spend here uh, before they take off and go somewhere else. So Evan, uh, this weekend is Manomet's Birdathon. Sure is. Yeah, can you let people know how they might be able to participate and um, maybe a few tips and pointers for seeing these birds while they're on fall migrations? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great point. So uh, some of you may be asking the, uh, the, the question that many of us ask ourselves as biologists, how are we funded? And the answer is uh, a bunch of different sources. Um, but uh, one of our biggest uh, sources of funds is actually our annual fundraiser, the Manomet Bird Fund, um, which in years past has been um, uh, we're, uh, an event where folks get out in teams and try to see as many species as they can see. Uh, people support the teams either by pledging for species or giving a fixed amount. Um, there's a, uh, I think there's a weasel over here. <laughs> it's pretty wild. We'll see. I'm a Eastern Phoebe. A weasel. <laughs> yeah, a sable colored mammal okay. that was shaped like a slinky disappeared into that hole. Uh, my guess is, is that it was a long tailed weasel, which they live around here. Kind of cool. Anywho, I'm highly distractible, <laughs> uh, which is what makes me a birder. Um, but yeah, our uh, fundraiser every year uh, is a really great time. Uh, people get in teams, they go out and see as many birds as they can over a 48-hour period. Um, this upcoming weekend is our birdathon, um, and we're adapting it a little bit because we don't want people going out with uh, uh, with um, uh, people outside of their immediate circle. So we're telling people to to keep it local. Um, to, to go out birding um, with those you've already been spending time with. 
Um, and if you encounter folks outside, you know, socially distance and all of that. Um, but we'd love it if people got out and just look for birds, um, try to find migrating birds. Um, and if you do find birds, uh, please report them to us through eBird. Um, eBird is a really great resource. We've actually got a website online, uh, or sorry, a video online on our website um, that uh, gives instructions on how to um, record your sightings with eBird and, and how to uh, share them with us in our Birdathon event. Um, so that we know how many people are participating. Um, we've also got a way for people to donate. Um, if you go to manometbirdathon.com, um, you'll see our main page, um, and you can actually donate securely through there. Um, and if you want, you can even create a fundraising page for your team if you want to go out and, and do that. That would be amazing. Uh, we've already got a handful of teams. The Landbird team will be going out over the weekend, uh, myself included. I'm particularly excited because I I'm only going to be I'm only going to be birding within five miles of my house, so I'm trying to figure out all the best places I can go um, to find as many species as I can. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a fantastic event and one of the main fundraisers um, and source of funds for uh, supporting our our banding operation here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. So this is uh, this can be a confusing bird, particularly in the hand. Most people are used to seeing birds through eight or ten power magnification of their binoculars. So when you see a bird up close and in the hand, um, it can be a little confusing. Um, this is actually a very familiar species. You can hear a cat bird in the background. Um, this can this is a very familiar backyard species called an eastern phoebe. Um, it's a type of flycatcher. So it eats aerial insects for the most part. It's got a flat bill. Really wide, yep, really wide. And uh, it's also got these bristles here along the edges of the mouth. And those uh, little mustache bristles actually help them funnel more insects into their mouths when they're trying to catch them on the wing. Yeah, he wears a really small band. Tiny little band. Thank you. These must be some white feathers. Interesting. That is interesting. Yeah, so I have to look at this. Yeah, it's interesting. You'll notice it's also got uh, yeah. some leftover brown feathers on the top of the head. Yeah. So this is a bird that has a different uh, strategy of molting than some of the other species we see. <laughs> so fortunately, we've got some great resources for when we have birds in the hand, including this very worn copy of the Identification Guide to North American Birds. Um, written by Peter Pyle, um, which is uh, quite a detailed treatise on uh, many species, um, and it gives a lot of information. Uh, definitely not a book specifically for people who um, are looking to get into bird identification, but for people who have birds in the hand and the correct permits and everything to ban birds, um, this can be a very uh, useful tool for helping determine the age and identification of birds. So then, is the banning process any different if you encounter an endangered species? Yes, it is. Um, we don't encounter them too often. The, uh, the best chance for us encountering an endangered species would be if we captured a, um, a golden-winged warbler, which is a very, very rare species of warbler in the state now. Um, but uh, typically, our, so everyone who bans birds, they need uh, state and federal permits. Uh, to do so. Um, we've got both of those, but our permit does not necessarily cover endangered species. So if we were working with endangered species, we'd need a third permit. Um, but uh, we have caught golden wing warblers in the past, and what we tend to do is we actually contact um, the Mass Wildlife uh, Endangered Species Officer and uh, talk to them about it. And they're usually fine with us putting a band on them. Excellent. Uh, well, Evan, we are at about 9.30 right now. So um, is there any one last thing that you'd like to show us from the banding lab or? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I guess, um, you know, uh, hopefully things clear up soon and we'll get back, get back to a little bit more of a normal operation. Um, and uh, 
you guys will have an opportunity to uh, come and visit us in person. But until that happens, uh, feel free to send us any questions you have. Um, and uh, if you think the work that we're doing is really great, um, I encourage you to share it with other people. Um, you can share, them, uh, share with them this video. Um, and if you're really interested in supporting and helping us out, um, share around the fact that our Birdathon fundraiser is coming up um, and uh, maybe you can help us out that way. So uh, thank you all for joining us and uh, thank you to the Banders. And uh, stay safe out there. Great. Thank you so much, Evan, Sarah, Megan, Cynthia, and Jeremiah for showing us around the banding lab this morning. And uh, just thank you to everybody else who attended and for being part of this pre special presentation. We hope to see you again on a future webinar or uh, in person at our banding lab again someday soon. Uh, thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful day.